This episode of 312 is brought to you by the HRP FOSS Collective, a monthly subscription service for PFOS information. HRP is proud to announce our monthly subscription service for PFOS information. Sign up for free and gain access to resources regarding PFOS regulations, studies, and impacts in your area. To sign up, email info at hrpassociates.com. That's info at hrpassociates.com. This episode of 312 is brought to you by Brown Rudnick. Powered by over 250 lawyers and key financial centers, including New York, London, Paris, Boston, California, and Washington, D.C., Brown Rudnick is a law firm designed for speed and performance. From major corporate restructurings, class actions, and cross-border mergers, to exotic asset class securitizations and the front lines of global climate initiatives, Brown Rudnick is committed to your business and passionate about results. All right, we're here today with Doug Cohen and Kyle Johnson of Brown Rudnick, joining myself, Sean Malin, in the HRP podcast booth here. Kyle, how are we doing today? I'm doing fantastic. Thanks for asking, Sean. And Doug, have you been treated well? I understand that you're actually in our, our corporate office in Farmington. Is everybody treating you well today? Yes, they are. They even provided me with lunch. Actually, I provided them with lunch, but yes, <laughs> being treated very well. Typical HRP. Yeah, exactly. Uh, already in edit. I mean, come on, guys. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, we really appreciate uh, you guys coming on today. We have an important uh, and emerging topic uh, to discuss, but as I kind of say that out loud, it sounds funny because I think that has the time not come to an end to stop put using the term emerging with PFOS, right? This is this is a uh, something that's been uh, coming along on the regulatory standpoint and perhaps delayed by COVID nineteen. But here we are in uh, let's say mid mid May in twenty twenty one, and we have a new administration. And we have uh, a lot of changes on the political landscape. And so HRP and Brown Rundick uh, talked about uh, putting out some content in regards to PFOS and the ever-changing, constantly changing uh, regulation and what things are, are coming out and what we're hearing on the street uh, from our own clientele here. So uh, the purpose of today's conversation is to discuss the intersection of the emerging regulation of PFOS with environmental due diligence. With that said, did you guys want to go ahead and do some sort of high-level introduction, Doug, on Brown Rudnick and the different services that you guys provide? Brown Rudnick is an international law firm with offices in all of the financial centers worldwide, New York, Boston, Paris, London, Washington, D.C., California. We represent <clears throat> primarily uh, corporate uh uh, companies uh, in uh, an acquisition uh, mode. We do a lot of uh, real estate and corporate due diligence as part of our environmental group, which Kyle and I are both members of. Um, we've represented real estate developers in the purchase of all different kinds of industrial and non-industrial properties, represented buyers and sellers in corporate transactions and the like. So uh, the firm is a, a, a broad-based uh, corporate uh, firm. Kyle and I focus on environmental and energy work. And as we prepared for uh, this podcast today, we recognized that what we didn't want to put together was another PFOS podcast with a lot of um, backstory and introduction. Obviously, if you took the time to tune into this podcast, you know a little bit about PFOS, I think, in general. Um, and so for the sake of a very brief introduction to PFOS for that one person that tuned in that, that isn't familiar with this term, PFOS is a type of chemical. It comes in uh, all sorts of, of chains and formulations. But essentially what we're talking about here is a, a long string uh, series of carbon molecules uh, with a uh, fluorine molecule on the end. These chemicals are so often used in a variety of different industries. I'm looking at a list here, and I'm just going to go through this process of listing these out because I want 
uh, our listeners to understand the breadth of, of these chemicals. Aviation and aerospace, automotive, herbicides and pesticides, building and construction, cable and wiring, cosmetics, personal care products, electronics, energy, firefighting safety, food processing, household products, medical products, metal plating, oil production, mining, paper and packaging, photography stuff and textiles. So it's everywhere. And um, we're going to talk about a little bit today how this regulation of a series of chemicals that touches virtually every industry and every manufacturing space that we have on the industrial and the commercial side for that matter, and, and how that um, compares to previous environmental initiatives over the years. You know, Doug, you've, you've been doing what you do for a long time. Actually, I think for the sake of clarity, can you talk to us a little bit about uh, your career and where you worked, specifically focusing on um, when you worked at EPA and what your role was there, and so how that kind of helps you um, understand the processes and where the regulatory framework's going. Sure. Appreciate that, Sean. So I was the third person hired to the Superfund program in 1980 before the statute was even passed. I worked in uh, Washington, D.C. in headquarters and worked on developing the National Contingency Plan and some of the implementing regulations and guidance under Superfund. And then I moved up to the administrator's staff at EPA and worked on Superfund reauthorization in 1984. After I finished Superfund uh, reauthorization, which was the SARE amendments, I decided I, as a lawyer, I needed to learn a little bit about litigation. So I moved over to the Department of Justice and litigated various environmental cases, um, environmental enforcement and environmental compliance type cases. And then in 1988, my wife and I moved up to Connecticut and uh, went to work for a law firm starting an environmental practice. And I've been representing banks and developers and industrial companies and multinational companies uh, ever since. And the perspective that I have on this is kind of this uh, harkens back to some of the uh, situations that we had in the early 1980s where there were uh, chemicals that we were finding that were ubiquitous in water uh, contamination, primarily in soil. Kyle and I have found in our interactions with EPA and the like that the PFAS issue has started to take a little bit of a prominent role. PFAS isn't considered a hazardous substance under CERCLA, so EPA isn't necessarily looking at this broadly as some other chemicals, but they are taking, and I think it's under, is it on Circle 104, Doug, where they have sort of broad authority to look at any pollution or contaminant, regardless of whether it's considered a hazardous substance under CERCLA. We're working on a, a particular super fun matter that, you know, it's in the five-year review period and has been for, I don't know, longer than I've been with Brown Rudnick, 15 years. And recently, within the past couple of years, have... Um, started requesting that we sample for PFAS at the site, despite the fact that, you know, there's no, and we may be getting our head of, ahead of ourselves a little bit here, but no groundwater receptors at the site, uh, no drinking water receptors, um, and no history of PFAS use at the site. Uh, we, you know, we, we as a you know, PRP group kind of pushed back on that for a couple of years without much luck and, you know, recently gave into it and ended up sampling for PFAS. Fortunately, it was below any um, regulatory or guidance standards out there. but um, Just to highlight the relevance of the point you just made, though, is you have a site here where you don't have any background information that there was ever any reason to be looking for PFOS here, yet here's a situation where you, know, you have a regulatory entity, in this case the federal government, asking you to sample for something that there's no kind of, I guess, background information to suggest that that's necessary. And to, you know, to make matters worse, PFAS can be found in a lot of PVC piping and other sampling materials or other materials used in the sampling process. So we, you know, we had PVC piping in the ground in connection with the monitoring walls for who knows how long that may have impacted groundwater quality out there. Um, those had to be pulled out and replaced, I think, with stainless steel monitoring wells just in order to actually uh, collect samples from the groundwater. So I think that kind of shows the direction that this is likely to be headed, especially if EPA regulates this as a hazardous substance. In order to get a timeline in our heads, what year 
or what quarter, if you can, about the did the EPA ask you to grab those uh, PFAS chemicals from that specific site? Was that a 2020 thing that is? I think the requests first started popping up, and I want to say 2017 or 2018. Wow. Um, and and we didn't end up doing the sampling until 2020. But it's been you know several years now. That's very interesting considering, I mean, was there a neighboring property you think was the reason for the ask? You, you know, we, we don't have any good idea of why they asked um, other than that EPA is going to do this everywhere. Yeah. Um, as, as I said, there was no, no, you know, obvious receptors in the area, no obvious sources of it in the area. And we did, you know, we did find it, but just not at levels that exceeded any standards, which, you know, speaks to its ubiquitous ubiquitousness and the fact that it's highly mobile in groundwater due to its uh, surfactant qualities. Sean, that's uh, actually a really important point is the street scuttlebutt is that EPA is going to be asking for these kinds of things on a regular basis at many, if not most, and maybe even all Superfund sites going forward. As Kyle pointed out in this particular situation, there's no evidence of any use that would trigger uh, looking for PFAS, yet EPA uh, frankly insisted that we do this. And the scuttlebutt that we're hearing from multiple sources is that that's the direction that EPA is moving in. We need to be vigilant about that as we're looking at property transfers, corporate transfers, and the like. So I had the opportunity, I think it was last Friday, to hear um, some comments on the PFAS issue from the acting deputy regional administrator for Region 4, Carol Manel. And uh, she came to a particular group that that, uh, I was a member of, and we talked about the different things, and she highlighted a lot of the charges that the EPA has been discussing internally. If, you, if you're not familiar, Michael, I believe his name, last name is pronounced Regan, not Reagan, Michael Regan, um, has been appointed uh, to be the head of the EPA. It should not go unnoticed that he was instrumental on the work of the Comor site, which was a PFOS release out in the Wilmington, North Carolina area. He is now head of the EPA. Biden-Harris have put $10 billion investment in monitoring and remediation of PFOS. There's a PFOS action plan uh, that came out. Um, I think that was late 2019, but now those steps are going into place. And as of April 29th, Michael Regan uh, sent a, an internal memo to senior leadership at the EPA, suggesting the creation of an EPA Council on PFOS, safeguarding Americans water, air, and land. That's kind of the backdrop. And I asked a question to the acting deputy administrator of when uh, we, we had mentioned CERCLA earlier in this piece, when PFOS were going to be added to the CERCLA list. Obviously, that has environmental due diligence implications because of the way that ASTM 1527 is written. That's an important point, Sean, and PFAS is going to be one of the chemicals, one of the substances that we look at going forward in an ASTM level assessment. Now, the question is, are they formally going to add PFAS designation in that situation? I, I don't know. I uh, The scuttlebutt that I've heard is that that it, it might be added to CERCLA, but I, I there hasn't been any formal rulemaking that I've seen. So what I heard from Carol Monell is that things are getting fast-tracked and things are near-term. And I have those in quotes on my notes here. But I have to think that as far as adding things to CERCLA and having votes and administrative capabilities um, to do those types of things, one would think that um, if PFAS are going to be added to CERCLA, list of hazardous substances, then that, that would have to occur sometime between now and, and, and next November. I mean, that's kind of the long sell there if it's going to get done. TCE and similar products aren't used in the magnitude of industries that PFAS is used in. So that's a kind of a major, major difference that I think is very relevant to, to these discussions. So as a lawyer looking at these kinds of things going forward, I am uh, concerned that within the next three to five years, the standard in the industry is going to be 
that we look at PFAS in every or almost every real estate corporate transaction. Doug, building upon that that uh, analogy to TCE, you know, you have all this experience when you're working for the EPA, and I just maybe you can kind of go back. You know, what we're seeing here, Kyle and I, is we're seeing a regulatory framework where you have. Uh, multiple states getting in front of the federal government on action levels. Even on the state level, we have a client in Connecticut where the DEEP showed up at their property wanting to uh, sample some effluent material. We've had clients in the Southeast who have received letters uh, from the local POTW uh, that sent an all call you know, to, to all of our industrial users. Some of them had surveys asking whether or not they use PFOS chemicals with a signature on the bottom of the survey that says that, you know, I'm of a certain officer of the company and I have the legal entity to sign off on this. So when TCE was becoming the rape, did you see these types of, of things where you had local government getting in front of it? Or was, again, the regulation of solvents, of uh, volatile organic compounds, was that more from the top percolating down to the local entities? Whereas here you see regula- regulation surfacing on all different fronts, uh, local, state, feds, and then also different departments like uh, NPDES versus Superfund types jobs. Can you speak to that? How TC, is TC different uh, from that? Yes, Uh, and I think the lack of federal involvement and federal guidance on PFAS has caused this patchwork of approach, which is what you're Uh, alluding to. And that's a a great concern. And that will not change unless and until the federal government acts. And I anticipate with the change in administration that this is one of the high priorities that the government will be focusing on, EPA and the like, will be focusing on what are the PFAS chemicals that are of concern, because if you've indicated there are all different kinds of PFAS chemicals, 3,000, 5,000, who knows what the number is. So what are the PFAS chemicals that we should be worried about? And at what levels? The federal government needs to speak to this issue, and then the states generally will follow. The lack of federal government guidance and involvement has, has set up the situation that we're in now. It's unfortunate because we have Minnesota that regulates at a certain level and Ohio that looks at it in a different way and Connecticut and, you know, North Carolina. It creates a lot of dissonance for all of us uh, that practice in multiple areas. On the heels of that, are you guys in Connecticut and in New York and Massachusetts, are you seeing uh, local regulatory authorities reaching out to industrial users? Um, POTWs or is the is the DEP in the states uh, handling that in the Northeast? The state of Connecticut, for instance, I think has reached out to or has sampled the the bulk of drinking water in the state, but to my knowledge, hasn't reached out to individual industrial users to sort of survey them on uh, PFAS usage. So, Doug, what are they going to do with that data? From your experience, from being in in an agency, um, you have states moving forward and and collecting drinking water supplies. What's the next step in that? That's obviously a data grab. Regulation. That's the next step. Once they generate all this data, uh, they will find, which I think they're finding, that these chemicals are ubiquitous um, and long-lasting. Well, and on on top of that, just as far as data grabs go, um, EPA has added, um, I think it's 180 plus compounds to the toxic release inventory as well. So uh, I think that's going to be another tool that they use to sort of find these industrial users who are maybe responsible for some of these plumes. So once they generate this data, they're going to figure out that it needs to be regulated, I believe, and they're going to institute some extensive studies to find out what the appropriate level is. I understand that some of those efforts are already underway. Yeah, I can tell you that in South Carolina, some data 
came out in August of last year. They had collected PFAS data from surface water sourced community drinking water systems across the state. And I'm looking at a table right now at concentrations that range from 5.9 part per trillion all the way up to 32 part per trillion, which as we sit now is below the EPA's um, health advisory level, which is unenforceable, of 70. But I think if you look at some of the other states um, and what their levels have been, which is generally around the 10 plus or minus parts per trillion, then, you know, these communities or these watersheds, you know, I'm looking at the Saluda River, uh, Lake Murray, Henry River, uh, Waccamaw River, you know, there are concentrations of PFOS and these that are, that are much higher than the 10 PPT that you're seeing on some of the state regulation. As far as ASTM goes, you know, HRP has an individual on the, on the ASTM task force for PFOS. And I think at this point in time, there's probably a bit of hesitation because of the understanding that the administration wants to add PFOS to CERCLA. Obviously, that would impact the standard based on the language, the standard, and how it defines what hazardous substances are. Um, but at the same time, if ASTM feels like the administration is going to add to CERCLA, then they kind of get frozen from having to move in front of the EPA to amend their standard, is, is the point I was trying to convey. So what we're hearing right now is ASTM is kind of internally, they are, they are obviously working on it. Um, and I think that in the short term, in lieu of uh, the Biden administration adding PFOS to CERCLA, I think what you're going to see probably in the short term is a revised ASTM standard that has PFOS maybe as a, as a non-scope consideration, maybe as in a business environmental risk. And it's my understanding that there's a lot of conversation within that peer group right now as to you know where exactly to put those things there. Nonetheless, what we are saying is it will be touched upon in the upcoming revised ASTM standard in some way, shape, or form, which you know puts the onus on the on the environmental professional and the company and, and how they're gonna go about doing that. Have you guys gone through um, a real estate or commercial transaction where you've you know talked to the client and pulled the trigger and discussed uh, the need to do some sort of PFOS assessment, whether that be desktop, whether that be um, expanding a radius around a particular site that and understanding the the property types around you or even within a phase two uh, scope of work the one situation in a real estate transaction that has it has come up for me and it's it's not a transaction yet but i have a client that um is looking to relocate their manufacturing facility and um take their existing manufacturing facility and redevelop it as residential, commercial, and the like. And we've advised them that uh, because of the firefighting foam that they use there, which had PFAS, and they had some use of the firefighting foam that the state agency is going to require them to look at PFAS. So we are developing a plan today to look at PFAS as a potential contaminant because we suspect, I, I'd even phrase it more strongly than that, we know that within the next five years or so, PFAS is going to be a chemical of concern. So getting in front of the eight ball, we've advised them to look at the extent of PFAS contamination at their property because that's going to have to be remediated. So what are the pros and cons of being in front of the eight ball? What's the upside to air quotes knowing versus finding out and then having to deal with it? How does that work in the in the acquisition world? So if I'm a buyer and I know that sometime in the future this is going to hit, I'm going to want to incorporate that into my deliberations and my considerations in the real estate and or corporate transaction. So for example, if uh, I'm purchasing a company that disposed of materials that may contain PFAS at various Superfund sites, I'm going to want to know that information. I'm going to want to know, is their site contaminated with PFAS? And Sean, you can talk to the technical issues, but as a lawyer, my understanding is that there are some very difficult and expensive technical remedies 
to uh, cleaning up PFAS. And the standards that we're looking at are incredibly low, parts per trillion, you know, 70 parts per trillion and the like are very standard. So as a buyer, I'm going to want to know what the risks are uh, because it's still an emerging concern. In five years, it will be something that everyone looks at. Kind of like, you know, uh, I use the analogy to TCE or the like, but maybe even PCBs is a better analogy. Um, you know, who thought 15 or 20 years ago that we'd be remediating PCBs in caulking material or asbestos uh, in the, you know, the caulking material? So, so I, I think that it behooves all of us to take a look at these issues in any of our real estate and corporate transactions that we're involved in. Now, that doesn't mean that you sample for PFAS in every situation. It means that it's something that we have a Sean Malin or an HRP evaluate in every situation. Those are the kinds of things that I'm looking for uh, as a buyer of these kinds of properties and businesses. And if you're a seller? <laughs> uh, <laughs> if I'm a seller, I will push back on that, frankly. <laughs> but for, but mm -hmm. but as a seller, I really want to know if I'm going to retain some liability. I want to know what the situation is with regard to PFAS. So if the buyer continues manufacturing activities at the site, the buyer uh, will be liable for those post-closing um, activities. And so therein lies it, Rob, right? Like from the seller's perspective, we're collecting data. Um, Kyle and I had shared a, a table here lists, you know, 25 different states with different varieties of action levels. And on the seller side, or if you're a buyer that chooses to go forward in the deal and move to the next phase of phase two, where there's actual, um, you know, samples collected, be it groundwater or soil, you know, in this weird interim space that we're in between the federal government coming out with their own standards. Um, you have, you know, several states, including northeastern states where you guys operated in New York, New Jersey, they all have come out with their own groundwater standards. And so talk to me a little bit about, you know, you get into an acquisition or you're working for a client that's maybe you're doing a portfolio work, right? Where you have a client that wants to buy one site in South Carolina, one site in New Jersey and one site in Arkansas. And you have New Jersey hanging out there with, a, you know, a 10 PPT or 13 PPT, whatever it is, different scopes. Uh, based on different state regulations. Yeah, I mean, that's that's a definite concern. You know, you have states like Indiana who's regulating, for instance, one PFAS compound, and you have states like Hawaii who are in the process of regulating a ton of PFAS compounds. So you kind of have to make an uh, informed decision on how you approach diligence at these sites, especially, you know, phase two type diligence. I just wanted to uh, touch on, if I could, uh, something that Sean had touched on a little bit, I think, but you know, due to the, this, this has been in use for quite a long time. I think it's been in use since at least the fifties as, as I understand it, it doesn't really break down in, in the environment. Um, so in that way, it's pretty analogous to PCBs that don't really go anywhere. So just as far as diligence goes, you can't just look back 30 years and be content. You may have to look back 50 or 60 years to see if there's uh, problematic industries that may have operated on the site, which, um, you know, Wastewater was just discharged to the ground in a lot of places or into the or into streams. Um, and this stuff doesn't go anywhere. It, uh, it, I mean, it, it's highly mobile, but it doesn't degrade. So it's, uh, there's a reason they call them the forever chemicals. And I think there's, um, there's deeper dives are going to have to be undertaken in some situations. Yeah. And it puts a lot of pressure on the environmental consultant who's engaged in the due diligence because not that um, neighboring properties wasn't a part of the site assessment as it was, but I think for the most part, you know, you get your environmental database and you have radiuses of distance from your site that you're looking for. I think it really is going to require um, some retooling on all of the consultants and the, and the internal training that they have for their staff of trying to pinpoint, you know, that list I read off to you guys. I mean, it's everything, right? So one way to handle it is just to um, collect sample, you know, say, 
I mean, you could throw a dart at a map and say, you know, there's a PFOS concern there and probably argue your way into finding that. Or do you start with specific industries, right? And I think that that's where um, obviously the chemical industry has a bright hot spotlight on it. And some of these other other type industries, you know, it's, it's kind of going to be one example at a time uh, where people are kind of focused on that. You know, Kyle, you made a comment that you were noting that some states um, who had gotten ahead of EPA as far as proposing and, and or implementing a groundwater standard, sometimes it's POFA, sometimes it's POFS, sometimes it's totals, and then you have other states like North Carolina that grabbed a Gen X, you have Indiana uh, that grabbed PFBS. Thank you. And, and so why are those oddities? Well, those states obviously had some sort of uh, release in their specific jurisdiction where that's what they decided to focus on. When you have 4,000 chemicals here, which ones do you create standards for? You're obviously uh, going to start with the ones that are in your backyard. Yeah, the uh, the states that are sort of ahead of the ball in this are, I think, directly correlate to states that have had big issues like North Carolina uh, with the yeah. Kemmer, Kemmer's issue and Minnesota, I think. I think it may be a 3M plume that was, you know, reported on that was, I think, hundreds of miles and 100 square miles, more than 100 square miles in area. Wow. It speaks to the sort of mobility of the stuff. That kind of gets back to the point of the, the treatment works, right? The wastewater treatment plants, sludge applicability. I mean, how do you guys envision, um, are you going to see a big government infrastructure plan where we're overhauling all of our uh, wastewater plants to try to treat PFOS? Or do you think that um, that money just doesn't exist and that that will be more of a, hey, we're going to go find the polluter um, to take care of this as opposed to ret- retrofitting um, you know, our infrastructure systems? I, th- I think right now you're seeing some jurisdictions um, sort of acting um, proactively and um, installing and implementing uh, treatment systems. Um, but those same jurisdictions probably don't have the the means to go after um, the sources of these um, releases. So I think right now you're going to see jurisdictions acting proactively to you know protect their citizens and protect themselves, frankly, from uh, lawsuits down the road, perhaps. Um, but going forward, as this becomes a regulated um, an area of regulation, I think you're going to see the that um, the opposite, and that uh, industrial users responsible for the re- these releases are going to be responsible for that type of uh, remediation or treatment. Sean, uh, that's actually a good segue into what are the kinds of treatment technologies and approaches to address, we're primarily talking about groundwater or uh, water contamination, what are the treatment technologies and relative costs for those technologies to address PFAS? At this point in time, it's it's an extremely expensive endeavor. Um, so it's kind of a, a trick question that I threw at you, Kyle and Doug. I mean, I, I think that, you know, the, the types of technologies that are currently available with the understanding that there's a lot that are, that are coming to the forefront every day. Um, you think of incineration was on the front end of, of PFOS, although you're starting to hear some negative chatter nowadays that, that um, some of the incineration practices, maybe, you know, it's an extreme amount of heat that's required um, to take care of these compounds. And if you have a particular situation where somebody did, wasn't doing the thermal at a high enough temperature that perhaps they were making the, the situation worse, um, dispersing those compounds into the air. Um, a lot of filtration, ex situ methods, um, you know, carbon, substrate, resins, all of those things are in play. Who's going to take this stuff? Um, is it going to go to the hazardous waste landfill network that we currently have? Is there going to be uh, a new place in the country where all the PFOS waste goes? And then, you know, the other thing you have to take into account is when you're talking about filter media like carbon um, specifically, you know, there are other things in this water besides PFOS. There are chlorinated solvents. Um, there are low levels of this, that, and the other thing. And so it's just another... Um, it's just another compound that takes up valuable carbon space. So, you know, I was kind of talking to um, our CEO, Dan Titus, Doug, about how I think that we spent the last 10 to 15 years 
you know, walking away from pump and treat from a remediation standpoint, subsurface that is, groundwater, um, I think we're walking back towards pump and treat because the only way, you know, I think the in situ um, technologies for handling PFAS is, is very much at the beginning of this whole thing. Um, and I think that anybody that, that needs to get their bang for their buck um, and recognizes that maybe you have a plume with TCE in it, but also PFOS because of the nature of what that facility was doing. You know, you're almost going to have to treat that ex situ, meaning pump it out of the ground and bring back the pump and treat systems and scale up and put vessels on both sides to handle all this other kind of stuff. And, you know, we can get further into the weeds with 1,4-dioxane and all these other compounds. Uh, you know, PFOS aren't the only emerging contaminant. So it's, it's, it's really cloudy right now and, and very expensive to, to deal with those technologies. So, um, you know, it's going to be very interesting to see how the, all this goes. Sean, that's really a, a, an interesting thought. And in the 1980s, when I first joined uh, EPA, um, the only technology that was really effective with chlorinated solvents was a pump and treat technology. But over the years, as uh, EPA got more experienced in treating chlorinated solvents and the industry developed other technologies, we moved far away from uh, pump and treat, and that's the extreme rare case today uh, to treat chlorinated solvents. You use in situ, you use bio, all different kinds of uh, techniques. And I think we're going to find the same thing with PFAS, that maybe today the technology of choice is a pump and treat. In the future, we're going to find other treatment technologies that are cheaper, better, and more effective, like we did with chlorinated solvents. Um, so, so I see that evolving, hopefully evolving, as we move forward. When you look at the end goals, pump and treat will be around for a while because we just talked about how hard it is to even destroy these compounds, right? The forever chemicals, as Kyle said. Um, so, you know, the focus of what the end product of, of a remedial effort is going to look more, at least from my vision, from setting what we know now, is going to be more land use restrictions, um, more making sure it stays on your property as opposed to going off site. That's going to be the hyper focus because until we can develop some technologies that address these things, it's going to, it's going to really be a risk management type, risk assessment type approach here for the foreseeable future. And that's exactly what we did in the 80s with chlorinated solvents. You put barrier wells, you pump the barrier wells so that it would move off your Keep site. site. Yeah. You know, source removal, those kinds of things. Um, mm -hmm. so, so I see, hopefully, this evolving. Uh, it'll go through phases, and I, and I really think that the chlorinated solvents are very instructive uh, for, uh, for, for the PFAS uh, situation. Knowing what you know now, in combination of having a gut feeling for what's coming, and when I say what's coming, I mean in July, uh, December of this year, and as I pointed out you know, prior to um, November of next year, um, you get a you get a phone call from a client that you've done lots of acquisition work for, or you get somebody called off the street. Um, how are what what are you guys prescribing? You know how are you? And obviously there are nuances between whether you're the seller or or the buyer. Um, but what's the stance that that you gentlemen are taking with the information you have in hand right now? as far as recommendations for PFOS assessment. And I think this is a this may be a pitch for HRP, but we're going to going to rely on a consultant that we know has this on their radar as a potential issue even if it's not regulated under uh, ASTM at this point. You know, we um, are focused on the legal issues a lot of times and don't always, you know, dig into the phase 1 as deep as we should maybe. So we want a consultant that's highlighting those issues for us. You know, if there was a fire station on the property 40 years ago or some other type of industry that's going to be at issue we want that highlighted for us on a going forward basis and uh, i think the first step in that um is relying on a consultant that has it has it on their mind 
I, I also think that when we look at acquisitions and property transfers, that one of the factors is going to be EPA involvement. Will there be EPA involvement in the site? If the answer is clearly no, maybe we evaluate PFAS a little bit differently. If there will be EPA involvement in the site, um, there's a much, much greater chance that PFAS will become a an issue that needs to be looked at and evaluated through sampling going forward. That's going to be another factor that we look at. But as as Kyle said, I think you know we want to have a consultant that is experienced and able to get these issues on the table for us. Here are the industries that used it. This site did not have any of those industries there, but they did have a, a fire station or a firefighting foam. So we we might want to look at PFAS in that situation. The other thing I think that we need to think about going forward from an EPA regulatory perspective is whether EPA sets up a system similar to how they treat PCBs. Every EPA region has their own PCB coordinator. All of the actions that involve PCBs go to this one expert in the region, and that individual is uh, experienced um, and sophisticated with regard to PCBs. I think that that might be a model that is looked at in the uh, EPA regulation of PFAS, that there will be one or several point people in each region who will be the, for lack of a better word, a PFAS coordinator, similar to the PCB coordinator in each region. The one problem with that approach that we found is that uh, although they are experienced and sophisticated, the guidance changes depending on the region. So I have personal experience in Region 7 that is different from my experience in Region 1 or 2 with regard to PCBs. We'll be curious to see how this is set up by EPA going forward. One area that I'm sort of keeping my eye on is we have a number of clients that are PRPs or have settled at Superfund sites or are in, you know, record corrective action and have been focused on PFAS up until this point. If it, you know, if it gets regulated by EPA, there, there's the potential because of the PFAS's ability to bioaccumulate in, in seafood, for one thing, um, among others, the potential for nat- natural resource damages. And a lot of uh, circle settlements that we've entered into over time ex- specifically exclude natural resource damages. So we may be in a situation where our our clients, you know, have paid X number of dollars to get out of any liability associated with that site, but may get dragged back in if there's any uh, big natural resource damage claims stemming from these releases. That's a really good point. I'd be remiss as a lawyer if I didn't talk about some of the other legal issues that may or may not impact, um, you know, the environmental consultants. But there's going to be a huge amount of litigation going forward over PFAS. There already are um, PFAS manufacturers who have been sued, and that is going to clearly going to continue. So there will be litigation against PFAS manufacturers, similar to litigation against, you know, Dow and DuPont and all the other uh, companies out there. And then uh, second, there's going to be what I call secondary litigation. So plaintiff's lawyers are going to be looking at new companies and new products as, you know, cosmetics, for example. I don't believe cosmetics manufacturers have been sued uh, for PFAS. I think going forward that will be an issue. And then third, the regulatory initiatives that we've been talking about in the Biden will, in my opinion, generate additional legal liability for companies, current and former owners of facilities where PFAS has been handled. And that increased regulatory burden, I think, will yield 
you know, various actions under environmental laws and regulations. It'll be, you know, your typical Superfund cost recovery actions in that context. Finally, there will be toxic tort type claims, I think, on the PFAS situation against manufacturers, plaintiffs, lawyers looking at, you know, people who are injured by the PFAS, by exposure to PFAS, there will be a a lot of lawsuits going forward. Uh, How that impacts uh, the kinds of things that we do, um, it's another factor that you know, lawyers and to a lesser extent consultants are going to have to look at when we represent companies and look at the legal liability that they face. There may be SEC and other reporting obligations that impact this, similar to how companies are now having to report the impacts of uh, climate change. As I said, as a lawyer, I'd be remiss in not mentioning (laughs) those to the listeners here, but uh, I think we should all keep our eyes and ears open for these kinds of cases going forward. Doug, just to play devil's advocate a little bit, due to the type of health effects that they're seeing from this, uh, I think they're considered hormone disruptors. There's, I think, kidney issues associated with a few of these compounds. And only a few are considered carcinogens. I may be wrong about that, but I think there's just a a handful of them that are uh, and not necessarily the most ubiquitous of them. Do you think that the toxic torque claims are going to be more difficult to claim given these sort of different types of health issues? As an anecdote, we um, we settled a toxic tort claim, as I said, several years ago for TCE, and there were several hun- hundred plaintiffs. And the kinds of complaints that we found were, frankly, funny, sweaty feet, sweaty hands, all the way up to uh, various cancers and and other serious illnesses. Although when you search through the literature, there is little support for most of those kinds of injuries. So, so Kyle, that's a long-winded way of saying I think toxic torts are difficult cases to prevail on anyway. And I think your point is well taken that this these will be very difficult cases. But that doesn't stop the plaintiff's lawyers from suing our clients uh, for exposure. That's a good point. And and given the fact that everybody has some level of uh, accumulation of PFAS in their blood, they're not going to have trouble finding plaintiffs. Yeah. Yeah. That's the concern. Yeah. Somebody's already working on that, right? Somebody is uh, establishing what the baseline concentration is in the average American's bloodstream, right? Um, That'll play a major role in any of those cases. Yes. Um, It's something like, I think the NIH has said, I don't, I don't know what at what, what level, but ninety eight percent of the population has some detectable level of P, PFOA in their bloodstream. And I yeah. think that's not just nationally, isn't that internationally? That there's that could a be, huge yeah. percentage of the population that has some level. Whether that's a harmful level or not is another question. And these are not naturally occurring, so we all know it's man made. Yeah, and they found. PFOS on Mount Everest, I think I saw an article a couple of weeks ago, which, you know, the Gore-Tex from the hikers, or is it? That's to be expected. Yeah. With all those hikers, with all their Gore-Tex and their plastic and the like, it's to be expected. Well, gentlemen, thank you so much for sitting down with us today and kind of talking through this. I hope that uh, this content is helpful to our listeners. I think that we've highlighted some um, challenges, but also some ways to address certain issues specifically in the realm of environmental due diligence. Um, HRP will continue to keep you up to speed with the latest as far as um, environmental regulation coming out from a variety of different levels and certainly we'll be keeping a sharp eye on ASTM uh, for how they address PFOS in their forthcoming standard update. So with that, uh, thank you Doug and thank you Kyle. We really appreciate you guys coming by and uh, participating in this for us. We, we really enjoy working with you guys and, and appreciate your partnership and uh, helping folks get all this stuff done. So thank you for your time. All right. Thank you. Thanks for having us, Sean. Hello. Welcome to the Play Hard section of the 312 Podcast. I am Tom Simmons, and I am joined today by CEO Dan Titus and CFO Joe Cardinale. Say hi, guys. Hi, guys. Hi, guys. 
So, how are you guys doing today? Good. Terrific. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what are you drinking this uh, this afternoon? I am drinking unspiked coffee. It's black with ice in one Splenda. Nice, Joe. Same, except with toasted almond, no Splenda. Toasted I almond. Can I see that? Yes, what? toasted almond shots. How is yeah, it? we should fix. It's pretty the, good. I like the, the unspiked almond. part. Like, yeah. what are we doing? We can take care of that. Do you want to? You want to break Did it? Did you bring a already? glass? Stuff? I didn't bring it. Well, it's in a glass already. It come, comes in one. <laughs> Not sharing that with anyone. Actually, Tom told me to bring glasses, and I've utterly failed. Sounds about. I right. have them back in my office. We can grab them. You want me to go get them? Yeah. All right. Thanks. Wait one. All right. I'll be. R- Check wait, one. Wait. Pause. Take two and two. Yeah. I'll be right back. Okay. I am drinking. Oh yeah, yeah. Keep yeah, your like... claws sharp. A New England IPA from Fat I Orange. I saw that Cat. can. It's a cool looking can. It's a very good beer too. So Let's folks, while Dan is retrieving some glassware, probably want to cue you in to the fact that this will most likely be the soccer podcast. There's a very good chance it'll be soccer talk. So uh, get yourself ready for that roller coaster ride. Get some popcorn. Uh huh. Big content coming. Mm hmm. <laughs> big content coming. Big content. It's a big content lots, episode. Lots of content. Content heavy. There's about three soccer fans in the whole company. We're making some more. That's right. Yeah. That's the goal. Mm-hmm. You might make one here today. <laughs> here he is, folks. Dance back. Ha, ha, ha. Yay. Yay. Oh, he can't hear he this. He can't hear that, no. <laughs> it's... That laugh Crowd, track. Crowd I, loves you. I like that laugh track uh-huh. lasts like a lot. It's really long. long. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Dan's here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think you should do the laugh track though. Be sure to tip your servers. Mm-hmm. Uh, thank you. Cheers, Cheers, fellas. Cheers. Mm, bourbon's nice and sweet. <sighs> well, that's pretty good. I like mm. that. Not it's not right, but it's pretty good. Mm-hmm. So, uh, what's going on in the wide world of soccer? Keep me. It, I know nothing about the sport or what's happening in it. Well, that's a like a really loaded question. How much time do you have? Because <laughs> it's a lot. Uh huh. Well, currently is the Euro twenty twenty in twenty twenty one. Um, going on right now. Sorry, run that back to me one more the time. The Euro twenty twenty tournament. It's okay. going on right now. It's all so, the best clubs of Europe and Asia. Not clubs. Mm-hmm. I'm sorry. National I'm sorry. Teams. Countries, yes. Yeah. Countries. So it's okay. it's like it's like kind of like the Olympics of soccer where the countries play each other mm-hmm. in a in a regional tournament, in this case the Euro, which would be, you know, the European tournament. Mm-hmm. With teams from Asia. But and why semantics. Is that? Well, semantics. You know, they're trying to expand their fan base yes. and make more money. So anyway, the Euro- Joe's right, the Euros are going on. Which is fun to watch. It is fun. Yeah. Fans are very passionate. Yes. Very passionate. Weird not seeing full stadiums, but Well, still. there's been a couple. Has there? Yeah. I think the Portuguese uh, home field game, I forget, was it? I forget where it was. It was in Portugal, obviously, but it was full stadium. I just saw today that they might take the finals away from England if they don't open it up for full capacity. <laughs> saw that today. So that's what's going on currently. Okay. But me and Dan yeah. are very big English Premier League fans. Yes. So. Which is club side. Which is the club side. Right. And we always say, like, any one of those club soccer teams could probably beat most any country's team. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Why is that? Well, because the, the club teams are, like, the equivalent of, like, you know, American professional teams, like the Yankees or the Patriots mm. or whatever. Mm-hmm. And so since it's a global game – what those clubs do, which are the biggest sports franchises on the planet. People in the United States don't typically understand that. I think the most valuable f- sports franchise on earth is Man Man, U- Man United. One of the ones, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, um, yeah, like you could go to like, you know, the depths of Africa and people like know who Man U is, even though they might not know who the Patriots or the Cowboys are. So like super crazy brand p- penetration. But anyway, the, the club side... Um, you know, they draw players from all around the world. They get the best players. They have big budgets and they buy, you know, like an English club can have players from Brazil and Korea and, you know, Russia and Kazakhstan and, you know, you 
not too many Americans, but <laughs> um, you know, all no, over the not globe. Borat either. Borat's yeah, not Borat. Borat. Mm-hmm. So um, you know, the club teams, especially the big club teams, are stacked with you know global super talents. Mm-hmm. So when they all get together and play against each other, it's pretty good. You mm-hmm. know, it's like it's if very good. You know, like in um, baseball or basketball in America where have like they have the all-star games, right? That's exactly what it is. Imagine if the whole NBA season was nothing but a bunch of all-star games where all of the teams were all-stars all the time and that was the league and they played against each other. Mm. So like an all-star team would beat the Celtics, no problem. Right. Mm-hmm. Even if the Celtics were, or even Lakers were really good, but an all-star team would beat them, no problem. And that's how the premier league is yeah and a lot of the other leagues too it's not just the premier league but so those national teams they they only play together for the tournament usually just tournaments every year a couple years they have a big tournament the national teams Mm -hmm. Uh, then there's world cup qualifying and then there's the world cup okay which is the biggest sporting event on the planet yep by far by far Hmm. bigger than the olympics even how do they measure that viewership and stuff and money yeah money Money. okay money money Money. Money. Yeah. It's fun to watch. The um the national teams, the the national pride of most countries oh. in watching their teams is just fascinating to watch. It's, yeah. it's it's crazy. It's like a blood sport almost, you know. Um so that's fun. The 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 fan the fandom I guess is just crazy. Yeah. I mean my little town in Italy that I'm from it just the game was on a couple of days ago and, and the town is just painted yeah. with Italian flags. Yeah. Everybody cares. Yeah. It it's amazing. It's Where, awesome. You know, here of sports viewership, you know, one sport might get like twenty percent of the population. Yeah. Where out there it's ninety five. Even my mom, who could care less about sports at all, is huge <laughs> soccer fan. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But then the club teams you know, the fan base is more like a traditional American, you yep. know, Patriots or But Dallas it's still Cowboys very fan. high viewer, viewership. Super high. The but the, the technical quality of the matches is better. Oh, yeah. So Absolutely. So they're different. Same but different, mm-hmm. if that makes any sense. Sure, yeah. Yeah, the quality of the, the, the actual soccer is much better on the club side than it Football. is the national. Football, yes. Yes. So what's uh, what's been going on in the the Euro tournament thus far? Anything interesting? Is that where that guy yeah, di- that's, died and didn't die? He, he, yes, <laughs> he died for a few seconds. Yes, uh-huh. yes. yes Who, he did. By the way, is a player that plays in the English Premier League. Yeah, for well, he used to. No, for, yeah, he's not anymore. For Tottenham, now he plays for uh, Inter. Yeah, which is it's the Italian, Italian league. soccer. But yeah, he got released today actually for the hospital. Yeah, like his heart stopped. It was pretty crazy. CPR. Yeah. Everything. And I guess the first person to do it, I thought I just read this, but the, it was a player that was giving him CPR at first. Yeah. Um, I think it was um, I think it was the, the goalkeeper. Um, it was the goalkeeper? I can't, I can't um, remember his name. Schmeichel. But, yeah, he came running over, started giving him CPR. Yeah. Crazy. So, like. 29 years old. So, apparently, he's going to get, like, a defibrillator mm-hmm. in his heart so that it doesn't happen again. And there is apparently, when I was watching the Belgium-Denmark game yesterday, apparently there is another player. I think it might be a Belgian player who has a defibrillator for the same reason and is still playing. Really? Wow, yeah. I would have thought that'd be disqualifying That's it. Yeah. Right there. Right. Yeah. You're, you're done. <laughs> I know, right? Probably should take it easy. It's crazy. <laughs> wow. I can't believe he's 29. Like, 29. I've been watching him play for, it feels like forever. Yeah. Mm. 10 years, maybe. Yeah. They're all so young. <laughs> I'm so old. We're so old. That was a big, big change for me was mm-hmm. watching professional sports and realizing that everybody out there was – Younger than I was. Yeah. Well, I remember watching sports with my dad and saying, you know, my dad be like, look at this kid or, or something like that. And I'm like, oh, he's the same age as me. Right. And now I'm the old guy saying, look at these kids. There are literally players that are making like their debut on some of these teams are like 17 years old. Mm. Well, there's that young American, Reina, for yeah. uh, Dortmund, German side soccer team. Dortmund. Son of a professional U.S. soccer player. Crazy. It was really good. See, are you regretting now that you asked this question? This is like a week-long conversation. <laughs> World I, football. I've been preparing Tom for this for <laughs> at least since he announced that both of us would be on there, yeah. that this would be a soccer. Which is why you wore the Liverpool jersey. Whatever, buddy. Is that Liverpool? <laughs> that is Liverpool, yes. Liverpool. IFC? LFC. LFC, okay. 
Liverpool. And what is that? A griffin? It is actually a fake bird. There's no such. So bird. that's what a griffin is. Oh, not... that's true too. You're right. You're right. But it's not a griffin. It's a, it's a liver bird. A liver bird? That's what they call it. Does okay. it mean like it eats your liver or something? I have no idea. It that's eats a, the liver no of its idea. victims. Maybe. See, it's another reason I don't like Liverpool. Whatever. The dumb Beatles mascot. come from Liverpool. See, my my team has a real mascot. Go on. It's the dragon, or the lion. A real depending mascot. On how you look at it. Yeah, it's a dragon or a lion. It's one of the. <laughs> it's other. like old school, like calligraphy style. Yeah, yeah. Mine's a fake bird. Yeah, well, dragons aren't fake. They used to exist. Yeah, yeah. They're in the fossil record. Right, mm-hmm. they're real. They are. Yeah. yeah. Game of Thrones. See. That's right. Isn't mm-hmm. that a documentary? The good book. <laughs> <laughs> Document. <laughs> Damn, what'd you say your team was? Chelsea. Chelsea. Chelsea FC. Okay. Mm-hmm. Who did a little bit this year. They did did all right. Yeah, they did they did, did, did all okay. right. They did okay. He they is did. wearing the blue. They for did Chelsea. They, that's not why I'm wearing this. No, it just happens to be a blue Under Armour yeah. sweatshirt. But yeah, that is the team color. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, they did all right this year. They won the biggest tournament. Yearly tournament, yes. Well, which is what? The Champions League. Okay. So remember how we were saying that club football is like the equivalent of American all-star teams playing in leagues. Mm -hmm. So from there, right, all of the big leagues across Europe, the top four finishers in each of the leagues. So every country has its own league. So in England, it's the Premier League. In uh, Germany, it's the Bundesliga. And that's like the... That's like the NFL, you know, versus, you know, the NBL or, uh, you know, whatever. NFL. What did I Canadian say? Football League. Yeah. That. NFL, CFL. That. Um, the top four finishers from each league then play next year in a tournament called the Champions League. So it's it's the top teams from the top leagues. Again, the teams being like all-star teams. So it's all-star teams from the top leagues playing against each other in a tournament. So it's like all-star plus one. Right. It's crazy. It's crazy. <laughs> and the money that's generated from this yeah. league is, you know, that's – everybody's striving just to be – they don't even – it's almost like being the winner of the league is okay. Yeah. I, I'm glad I won. Yeah. But the, the real prize is just being in the top four. Yeah. Then you're in this this tournament, the Champions League, which mm-hmm. pays tons and tons, tons of, of money. Yeah, but it the so as good as the quality is in the leagues, the quality in the Champions League because it's all the it's the top teams from the leagues is just insane. So Chelsea won it. This and Chelsea year. won it this year, and nice. the year before that, Liverpool won it. Yeah. Who who finished last in the Champions League? Yeah, you know I don't know the answer. To that. I, I don't know. Doesn't that mean they are? The last bumped down. Like no, that is not in the no. Champions League. That's not how it works. That's okay. how it works in the the leagues itself. You're, like the English you're, Premier League. You're close though, like Tom. Mm-hmm. That you're the idea of relegation. That's that's a good point. That's another thing that makes club football so exciting, right? So they have this thing called relegation. So Champions League is a tournament. So you get invited to the tournament, and if mm-hmm. you lose in the tournament, then you're out. But you could get invited the next year if you're a top four finisher in one of the leagues. So you don't get relegated from the Champions League tournament. Mm. But in the leagues, so every country also has kind of like in the way that Major League Baseball has like, you know. Major League, AAA. Major League, AAA, AAA, Mm. AA kind of thing. So they have the same thing in soccer. But what happens in those leagues is in the top league, the bottom three teams get what they call relegated. So they get sent back to the lower leagues. And then the top finishers from the lower leagues get promoted to the top league. Mm. And this happens every single year. And what makes it fascinating is that it changes the complexion of the league all the time, number one. And then number two, it makes the whole thing exciting. So if you think about like uh, typical American sports, like only anybody really cares about what's at the top. Nobody cares about the last place teams, right? Mm -hmm. But sometimes... The, the drama, the drama of sports in these football leagues is actually at the bottom, the combat to, sur- to, to stay up, as they say it, right, to not get relegated is, is, can be more intense than even at the top of the league because mm-hmm. it's so much money. And when you get relegated, you lose it all. they take like a huge pay cut and mm-hmm. everything. So it's, 
it's crazy. So and just like if you're getting moved up, you get a huge bump in pay. Yeah, that's interesting because I always thought it was just you get moved to like the junior league or whatever it is. I didn't realize your pay got hit. Too. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. They're because again, it's yeah. all the TV. Makes sense. Yeah. It's all TV yeah. money. Yeah. yeah. So that TV money is distributed, and just by moving from in English soccer, it's the 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 Premier League is the top, and then there's Championship. I think is the, yep. the Championship's one below number two. Yeah. So that moves them up, and they get a huge. Uh, pay and and the funny thing is it's actually just not that it it goes down farther than that so even yeah. the last three teams of the champions the middle te- tier gets bumped down to the third tier and they go so everybody moves up and down from there it's crazy so it makes it ultra competitive from top to bottom like mm-hmm. there's no bad spot it's just it's it's amazing to watch I've heard this floated as an idea to introduce into, like, the NFL to mm, stop, yeah. like, teams from, like, throwing games at the end of the season yep. for, yep. what, dr- for I don't better think it, draft picks? Is that Yeah, I don't do think it? it'll ever happen here. It's I hard, could see it happening with baseball. I could see baseball maybe, but it, yeah. I think football because of the, you know, physicality of it all that it's just it'd be too There isn't really out. a second league for football and there really anyway. Isn't. No. Mm. Baseball has the structure already with yeah. the with – but the problem with the uh, Major League Baseball is all those teams underneath the Major Leagues are attached. You know, they're all the draft picks or the minor leaguers of the guys yeah. in the Major League. So they'd have to be some kind of separation there for that to work. But yeah. they at least have the, the, the semi-structure to it all. Uh, that, that does make it a lot more interesting mm-hmm. to have that fight for the in the bottom as well. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, what's the FA Cup? I remember that from Monty Python jokes. I was going to say, did you do some research it. or something? No. Yeah, it's a, it's, it's still an English tournament, but yeah. it's just, it's, it's not as popular as it once was. Yeah. It's all of the, it's the top three leagues in England, mm-hmm. so it's like the Champions League, mm-hmm. only just for just English teams. England. It's all yeah. of them. Oh, who? There's other non-English teams in the Premier League? No, 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 no. It's the three leagues, like we were talking about, that get moved up and down. So okay. in this league. tournament, it's all the teams are in this tournament. Right. All all those leagues. Oh, so you, no matter where you are, you could be in the F. Correct. Right? Okay. So it would be like in baseball, major league, and triple A teams, and, and double A teams, teams are all in the same like tournament. The top finishing teams in those leagues. I, I don't do know how many. I don't know how many teams are. Yeah, I don't invited to it. it yeah. Could be top eight. I, I'm not yeah. really sure, yeah. but it's all the divisions are playing against each other in that. It's not a very popular. It used to be a lot popular. Or I think it's popular, more. you know, in England. It's if you're English, yeah, but it's <laughs> more popular for the tier two, tier three teams than it is yeah. for the tier one teams. I would think so. Yeah, the tier one teams, you just watch the games and they throw out, you know, their 18 year olds to mm-hmm. play in the league. It is fascinating, though. So, uh, what? Uh, it what would is be. The, what sorry, to interrupt, Dan, but I'm just thinking, like, how awesome it would be to, like, <laughs> if like the Red Sox played the Yard Goats over here in Hartford. And, well, that's what I was that's just going to say. So it's really and, big for and, the Yard Goats, but, and the Yard Goats yeah. won, right? Yeah, which is which happens. <laughs> it sometimes. does happen. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Every once in a while, those little clubs will knock off a big club because, again, the big yeah. clubs. It, because there's so much soccer that they play, they don't treat that tournament as one of the bigger ones, so they throw a lot of the. Substitutes and, and that's kind of like that's stuff. kind of the beauty of all of these tournaments. It really, I really thought about it before, but you know, like when USA beat Russia in hockey, what was that 1984 or something like that? Sure, like it was the 80s. I'm pretty sure mm-hmm. it was like the biggest deal ever because it was su- such a Cinderella upset. You know, mm-hmm. that stuff happens in in world football like all the time, sure. mm-hmm. all the time. At the even at like the international level, like there'll be like you know an African team. That will play in the World Cup and will get like to the round of sixteen against well, like every single odd, and they're it's just it's awesome to watch. Was it's it so Macedonia or what? there was some country the last World Cup that did that as well, like uh, yeah, made to the final eight or something? Yeah, it's just fun to watch. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, what's that other tournament that that that's in uh, England or actually it's not just England, but I don't know. top seven. You have to be in the top seven. Yeah, to make there's it. so many, but that one has at least implications if you win it. You're a, you're invited to the Champions League. Mm-hmm. Yeah, what the I, heck is that tournament? I, I can't I remember. There's so many. There is, but that one at least has something attached to it. Where that FA Cup, yeah, you know, that's just not for anything really. Yeah, told you, Tom. There's a lot of layers. So what are we looking for? Tournaments in in England? No, in it's it's all of Europe. But God, I can't remember the name of it. But if you're top seven in 
these leagues and you're not in the top four, so it's those last, last next three teams, they get mm-hmm. put into another tournament. And if you win that tournament, you actually get an invitation to the Champions League. It's not UEFA Euro? All right, everybody get on their phones to look for <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm actually looking at now. pictures of my car. Oh. How's your car doing? It's doing great. Wow. Oh. <laughs> Jeez. For people who can't uh, see that picture... It's a car. With, a lot of pieces. It's a car with no engine. I think we said was that it just a chassis and some. It was a transmission, bell housing, <laughs> and pretty much nothing else. Yeah. Oof. There's the there's the motor. Aw. Yeah. What? So what's what? What's the next steps there? Europa Put a new League. one in. Did you say Euro- Europa? I said UEFA. Oh, it's Europa League. Europa. So that is like the top seven team, or I'm sorry, the top four make the Champions League, but the next three make this tournament. And if whoever wins goes to uh, an automatic bid to the Champions League. It's Mm. the tournament for losers. It's basically the tournament for losers. But in college basketball, how they have the NCAA is the main tournament, but then they have the NIT. So it's basically like an NIT, and whoever wins it gets to go to the NCAA tournament. That's how that works. I like watching hockey. Hockey is fun to watch, yeah. especially playoff hockey, where if I had to equate a sport similar to, like, passion-wise yeah. for soccer, yeah. hockey would definitely be it. Those it's fans are absolutely insane. It's a very similar game. playoff yeah. sports. It what is you, a very, a very similar, similar Where do you game. think that comes from? Because we talked I, about so a lot of the reasons in soccer that, like, oh, yeah, it totally makes sense why people would nationalism be so and, into it, yeah. but also the way the league is structured where everything counts. I don't know what it is with hockey that, that makes it. We should have invited Everett to this podcast. I wonder, this is just a theory, but I wonder if some of it has to do with the idea that hockey is another sport that's not just an American sport. Sort of self-correcting as I go here, but like, like there isn't really another major league baseball out there. There isn't really another NBA out there. There isn't really another, well, certainly another NFL out there. But like hockey, like there's big European. Look at the Russians; they win well, everything, right? But like the, that's a good point. And the other, I'll, I'll continue is what there's a lot of people from other countries who like hockey. No, that are on the teams. That too, right? You know what I mean? I mean they're. N- I'll be honest. I think Americans are the minority right. in hockey. So, mm-hmm. me, so even though it's more of a you know sort of a northern hemisphere or extreme southern hem- hemisphere, not meaning not the equator, kind of sport, um, maybe maybe part of its its Could enduring be. popularity is the fact that even though it doesn't have such a great fan base in America, it has a greater fan base globally. Yeah, Russia. I don't know. Given that this is a country of immigrants. Hmm. Canadians, yeah. I mean, that's a good point. I don't know. It, it's fascinating that America, the United States, is such a dominant cultural influence on the world, but our sports aren't really popular anywhere outside of it, even no. though they even though Absolutely. they completely dominate our own culture. So outside of here, yeah. Basketball is pretty popular in other parts of that's the world. That's true, yeah. Yeah. I guess it would probably equate to soccer. In, I mean, soccer has a mild interest here. Where I think in other state. countries yeah. it's probably mild as well, but mm. but it's there. Yeah. Where baseball, football, is practically nothing. I always get like these arguments. Baseball though is popular in Japan. Sure. It's very popular. Popular like on the Pacific Rim. Yes. For some reason. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. For some reason, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know, man. I like any time. Coincidentally, all the. Nations we've invaded, our sports are really popular. <laughs> yeah, look uh, at that. I wonder why. I wonder how that works. How's that happen? It's sports colonialism. Yeah, right. Um, You're gonna like baseball, damn it. God damn it. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's that's weird. Hmm. America is weird. It's a strange place. That's why I live here. That's why we all live here. Yeah, Joe's leaving though. I would want to. Well, he, he I can. <laughs> Earlier, he said he was from Italy. So yes, I can. I actually learned I last week. I have a house I'm ready to go. No, yeah. like to burn it down. Like, what do you mean, ready to go? To like move. Oh, house. you mean to live yeah. in? Oh. Yeah. He has to flee the country. Depends on who's president in 2024. I don't know. It'd be we'll aliens. See. Though all those little flying pills around, you know, that the DOD's been like they're gonna land and take over. And just to let you know, the town that I'm from, the housing's like 20 grand for a pretty decent house. Out there. So I learned like two weekends ago from some friend of mine who is on the fringe um, that <laughs> actually 
the Italian pass passport is like the third or fourth best passport in the world to have from like a global entry perspective. Really? Yeah. As an ease of yeah. movement? Yep. Hmm. Yep. I'll have to ask my mom. I don't know who makes those assessments, but. I don't either. Hmm. Sounded good to me. Mm-hmm. My this mom. person is interested in getting an Italian passport. It's actually annoying because my so mom's last name on her passport's different than her actual last name. So yeah. They don't change last names in Italy when you get married. It's not a thing. That's an American thing. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Joe, what's, uh, how, are, how are things going in, in Italy now? Because I remember them early on. They were That country was one that was singled out in the media. Yeah, because right, it was one of the being, first early ones. Well, yeah. vaccines are still not that great out there. They do love their uh, baguettes filled with Nutella, though. That's for sure. <laughs> Nutella is good stuff, man. God. When I was playing football over there as a teenager, that's when I first learned about Nutella. I can't believe eat it by the bucket. I can't. I, I'm actually mad at my kids. I get mad at my kids because they don't like it. I'm like, what's the matter with you people? <laughs> it's it's <laughs> what's the matter? Chocolate. What's, what's wrong with you? <laughs> it's like the original chocolate oh, nuts. It's so good. Oh, it's awesome. It's my favorite. Uh, it's gelato. Cho- it's, it's, hazelnut gelato is my it's the best. So for the audience, right, Nutella is like mashed hazelnuts and cocoa. So it's like it's like chocolate peanut butter. It's heaven. Yeah. Heaven. <laughs> it's the best. The best. Schmear it on anything. Uh, I went to a Catholic school in Sp- Springfield, no Mass. Yes, I was an altar boy as well. But going to Catholic school, all Italian school and – Everybody there either has got a sandwich of Nutella or prosciutto. That's it. I don't think I've had – I didn't think I had peanut butter and jelly until I was in the teens, late teens probably. Mm-hmm. I've been having some weird dreams lately. I'm not going to lie. Go like, on. Yeah, like just f- crazy freaky dreams. I had a dream the other night that I was on a cruise ship, which I would never do because I hate cruises. Oh, love cruises. Oh, love them. Gross. Love them. Really? Love them. Why? Food. You don't have to go anywhere. But it the food takes you everywhere. But the food's all garbage. It's it not is. garbage. It's really good food. What? It's cafeteria food. No, it isn't. Yes, it is. What are you looking See, up? This is another video thing. of a cruise ship in like troubled waters. This is another thing that makes me think Joe's not Italian. He thinks cruise ship food is good. Ah, oh, fantastic! It's literally no fresh food. tomatoes. They don't give you fresh tomatoes, so I like it. <laughs> I anyway, the European cruise I took was the best cruise ever. Uh, I guess the point, though, maybe that you're making is it wasn't the ship that was the best part of the, the trip. It was the stops. Okay, but, that's, but that it, doesn't I'm, count. I'm, I know. That's why I'm agreeing with you. Because you could get to those stops without you know, a boat. Without a boat, yes. probably faster. Yes. Anyway, so I was on a cruise ship. So many videos of just. Oh, I don't even want to look. Of just Close that computer. furniture flying around. <laughs> the cruise ship hits rough seas. All right. That has never ha- I've never experienced that, so I don't know. That would bother me a little less, I guess. The rough seas? Yeah. Well, you have something to do. Yeah. They're big boats. Mm. It really is. Yeah. It just but makes you feel like you're walking a little tipsy. Yeah. No, we're talking about like everything that isn't bolted to the floor flies to one wall yeah. and then to the other. I've never experienced that in the four cruises I've been on. Well, there's always the fifth. Well, maybe I won't go anymore now that I know the food is shit. Do you think about it? <laughs> It's Think about it what? Is literally, it is literally ca- one oh. at, under protest. And you it had was a, a bad experience. One too many. And it was a Disney cruise. Oh. Oh, there you oh, go. God. Worst. Can I just say? I hate Disney. The world. A Disney yeah. cruise? Yes. What does that even entail? Well, Think so. Walt Disney World on a boat. Yeah. With all the characters and but, stuff. But I mean, like, where does the cruise go? Disney has its Normal own places, look. all the semi. Oh. Disney has its own island. It's called Disney K. Oh. Mm-hmm. Okay. Why is it called Disney K? K is in, like a term. Yeah. A nautical term for, for an island or something. Yeah. Like Small island. Is it? Yeah. yeah. Just like Key is. And uh, something new. It was, it was awful. So I won't even bore you with like all of the awful, awful. But like when we went to the K, you know, you pull in. And it's like any other stop. So you get off for like a day. But it's... Disney's Island. So they have like a, a lagoon and a beach and you can rent like, you know, skin diving equipment and all that sort of stuff. And like I'm stuck on this boat for like three days and I literally wanted to poke my eyes out. And so we finally get to the K and I'm like, listen, we're going to go snorkeling and stuff. That's something I've 
like doing in the past. My kid was, you know, I don't know, I think he was 10. So something he had never done, thought it would be great, right? So we go to the lagoon, we rent the the skin diving equipment. It was like a hundred bucks for a mask and a pair of flippers. <laughs> so, you know, it is Disney. they rip you off mm-hmm. beyond belief. But anyway, so we get in there. I didn't realize this, but like the whole lagoon, it's all full of like concrete Mickey Mouses and sunken ships and everything. All <laughs> Man-made fake, lagoon, <laughs> oh, right? God. And then the the opening from the lagoon to the sea, they have completely like walled off like this fine mesh steel fence. So like no aquatic life from the natural environment can get into the lagoon. So you end up snorkeling around this lagoon in the in the Caribbean, right? Where there's all sorts of tropical fish and cool stuff to look at, looking at concrete sunken Mickey Mouses. <laughs> Oh my God! <laughs> so you're gonna if that judge doesn't make whole, you hate Disney. I don't know what does. You're gonna judge the whole cruise industry on your one Disney cruise. Yeah, but Disney's like the apex cruise predator. <laughs> There's nothing better than Disney. No, bad. I'm judgment. just telling you, go on a cruise just you and Donna. See, if I'm going on vacation with my lovely bride, we're going to an island. Take so a boat get, there. No, I want to get there so that I could be there. I don't want to float there for a week in some little cabin. You know, smell next door the next door cabin's underwear and stuff. Oh like I'm, I'm out, man. I'm out. <laughs> I was in the army. Kind of reminds me a lot oh of living in the Lord. barracks. Yeah, just like the army. Kinda, it kind of does. Yeah. Scratchy sheets and brood freaking cafeteria server people. Oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> So it's important for people who are not familiar with this company, including new people who have just come to the company and probably haven't really learned. There's a lot of them. The what's the what yet. So when we when we talk about 312, 312 is sort of our, our synonym for culture, right? Because everybody's always talking about how important culture is. And there's probably a lot of people who even think that like Google campus culture is like, you know, they invented it. Like, it's the original idea. And it's really not. And so that's one of the reasons that we don't use the word culture because, you know, it's kind of passe at this point. So we use the word 312. But 312 is about um, HRP's culture. And it's a very uh, distinct, um, finely honed, long-run sort of set of um, unspoken, unwritten ideas that are just part of the fabric of the the company. It's... um, in a way, sort of a, a classic sort of work hard, play hard culture. But um, in both the work hard and the play hard part in this company, there's always been this sort of um, fierce sort of sense of personal loyalty to each other. It's a real team environment. And um, we look out for each other and we care for each other and, you know, we support each other in the hard times. And um, there have been lots of those over the years. The company's 40 years old now, it's crazy to say. Um, and then, you know, on occasion we get the opportunity to sort of celebrate. And so, um, you know, all of that, uh, sort of deep seated passion for each other sort of manifests in the place itself. And then when we have an opportunity to uncork and celebrate a little bit, it kind of really all bubbles to the surface and it makes this, um, a really amazing and fun place. And, um, I can say that, you know, we've been doing surveys for a long time now and whenever we ask employees, you know, what is it that, that is about HRP that makes this work for you? And everybody always says, I love the people that I work with. And I think that's kind of the essence of 312. All right. Well, thank you, Dan. Thank you, Joe. Thanks, Tom. All right, everybody. We'll see you on the next podcast. Bye. Ciao. Thanks for joining us, everybody, on this episode of 312. 312 is produced by HRP Associates. You can catch new episodes the last Wednesday of every month. Subscribe to this podcast to hear more. Check out our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash HRP Associates, Inc. Don't forget to rate this podcast five stars. Leave a review. It really helps us out. Thanks so much, everybody. Stay safe out there. Bye.